talking to me. Sorry. Zoned out. Thinking about the next mission. No. I was just looking at the moon. It's always so weird seeing it like that in the daylight. Thank God made a mistake. <laughs> Left the hall lights on. God didn't make mistakes. That's somewhat key to the whole being a God thing. Pretty sure he does. You know he's listening right now, <laughs> don't you? I'm gonna take a cell, circumvent the hayflick limit, you could prevent senescence. I was about to make the exact same point. It means the cell doesn't grow old, it becomes immortal, keeps dividing, doesn't die. We see aging as a natural process, but it's actually a fault in our genes. You get really turned on when you patronize me. It's really hot. Without it, I could keep looking like this forever. Oh, okay, well, that could constitute a mistake. <laughs> Welcome back, friends. Welcome back. It's time for another episode of the Strange and Beautiful Book Club. This is a movie episode. Our horror movie episode. Because we go fantasy, horror, sci-fi. So last week was fantasy. Last week was the fountain. I don't know. <laughs> and this week is horror. And so next week will be sci-fi. Although this was mm, marginally sci-fi. Maybe yes. sci-fi. Yeah. I, I think it's it classifies itself or whatever. But the community classifies it as cosmic horror. Cosmic horror. Yeah. So it's kind of space-related horror. Although we don't ever really discuss whether this is an alien life force, whether this is a complete... Multi-dimensional yeah, we don't. We don't life talk force. about it at all. In fact, they say I never figured out what it wanted or if it wants at all. Right, it was just there. Yeah, doing its thing. Doing its, doing it like a infection. Right, infection yeah, is bacteria not. Bacteria don't want things. No, they just want to live. They just, just affect just the area thing. around them. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, so, but, but before we get too far, hi, I'm Rachel, and I'm Matt. Welcome to the Strange and Beautiful Book Club. Kate and I always forget to do that. So I get to drop the music in at the most random places. And it's kind of fun to pick where to put the like intro. Yeah. But yeah. So means, you, means the listeners can't skip the intro. Whoa. Maybe that's part of my reasoning. Hang on. Pro tip. Pro, <laughs> pro tip. Keep them guessing. <laughs> then they can't skip your shit. Also, put all the shit at the end so they can just clip it 30 minutes before the end. They don't have to hear me talk about Instagram or Patreon or anything. Uh, so we watched Annihilation. Well, hold on. Oh. We have news. We do have news. We have important news. What is that news? We have two pieces of news. I'm ready. We got a Patreon. We do, That yes. we don't know. <laughs> Talked about her in the, la in the book. You know what? We should do it in all three. In a book talk, in yeah. a movie, and in a forever night because that way... No matter how you pick and choose, you get to find out that yeah. we have a Patreon. Who I we? have a feeling that this new Patreon doesn't really listen to anything other than the Forever Night episodes. What? I don't think we can make that generalization. Well. Anyway, hi, Meg. Hi, Meg. Hi. Welcome. Welcome to the Strange and Beautiful friend, Community. Friend Club. <laughs> <laughs> Best Friend Society. <laughs> Hey, Ryan. Haven't heard from you in a oh, while. Yeah, hi, Ryan. Oh, Ryan had to go back to work, so Ryan doesn't get to chit-chat as often. Yeah. But we still like you, Ryan. You're still in the best friend club. Treat yourself. We should start. We should make a theme song for the best friend club. <laughs> <laughs> I could commission the same guy who did our intro. Same vibe as last one. Yeah. But best friends. But think friendship. <laughs> 
Care Bears, uh, you know, that vibe. That's what we're going for. All right. Second piece of news. Okay. Yeah. A hundred followers. A hundred followers on Instagram. on Instagram. Holy poop. Did you think we'd ever get here <laughs> in November? Uh, I didn't think it would happen in three and a half months. Yeah. Well, you know what? It happened. We were at 63 followers at the book talk that Kate and I did for City of Nightmares because I made a crack about it. And that was what, like three weeks ago? Mm-hmm. So we took three months to get to 63 followers and then we took three weeks to get to 100 followers. Which is half again above 60. Yeah. Three. Yeah. So I don't know what code I may have cracked. Maybe we reached some sort of distribution tipping point, interaction tipping point for the algorithm. I'm not really sure, but I'm just ha- happy to have all of you, even if you're bots. We love bots. I like Murderbot. Murderbot's a bot. Yeah. Yeah. I work with computers all day. Yeah, exactly. Welcome to everybody. I automate things. We don't discriminate <laughs> here. <laughs> so be who you are and love what you love. Even if a bot wants to love our show, whatever. It's fine. Happy to have you. But speaking of and there's no robots. Like, there's no segue for this. We're just going to go back to Annihilation. Speaking of the movie that we watched, <laughs> uh, we watched Annihilation, which air came out in 2018. Which makes it the second most recent movie that we've reviewed. Yeah. Or any content that it's, we've reviewed. It's the most recent movie that we reviewed that we actually liked. Yes. Yes. Because or, we did do yeah, everything that we everywhere actually at picked once. ourselves. Yeah. Everywhere All at Once was a fan suggestion. Sorry, Ryan. And we didn't love it. Um, we put a lot of effort into trying to unpack why we didn't love it. So we didn't just off. I don't like to offhandedly say something's not great. That feels like jumping on the negative review bandwagon that yeah. I feel is the preponderance of media right now. It's just, why was this movie shit? Instead of, okay, well, you know, I didn't love the plot. Maybe the editing wasn't my favorite, but the acting was great or whatever. So we really try to, we really try to figure out what about it we liked, what about it we didn't like. Um, and everything everywhere all at once was just a stumper. I don't know. <laughs> just, I, cause, I think yeah. because of the hype, I just couldn't get over us winning all these awards. And that's great and really happy for it. But I mean, I don't know why. But that's okay. And that's all right. Not everybody loves to love everything. And not everybody's going to love Annihilation. And that's okay, too. And I got to say, the first time we watched it, Matt made me watch it. It was the second time I had watched it. Yeah. And you were like, I, I really think you'll like it if you just give it a chance. Yeah. And I was like, oh. <laughs> um, Matt's accustomed to my random dislike of media I've never seen. Not dislike. That's okay. not fair. It's like a block. I just don't want to watch new things. And he has to get me through it. And usually yeah. if he can get me through it, I'm happy with it. Well, and so one of the things, one of the aspects of this movie that I thought would make it more palatable for you is there's very little of characters doing stupid things. Yeah. Because that's the cheapest way to introduce conflict. For the most part everybody's making good decisions yeah. throughout the entire movie. Yes. It's just this situation is so far out of everybody's previous experience. Nobody knows what to do or even how to handle anything. Yeah, there's only one questionable decision, I would say. And it's not even... You could chalk it up as much to they're overwhelmed or like the one lady says, being in the shimmer is like the onset of dementia. Right. It literally makes you feel... Like you're falling, like you're unraveling. Right. Which even given that, everybody acts pretty rationally, except for the one lady, um, Anya. Oh, yeah. Who snaps. But that's more, a, it's a pretty realistic uh, reaction yeah. to the situation. She's the only one who is not military and hasn't experienced a significant loss. Right. She doesn't have any... Uh, emotional ballast. Yeah, she has the least emotional ballast, which is why she is immediately off keel. Why she's immediately cast adrift by the events that happen in the Shimmer when the others are really able to kind of work through it. Right, and I think um, uh, Lena, yeah. Natalie Portman's character, I think psychologically she has the the most ballast. Yeah, uh, because. She has the loss, she has the trauma, that stuff, 
But for her, there's an element of hope in this endeavor. Yes. Because she knows her husband made it out or someone who looks like her husband and has her husband's memories. A a husband-shaped thing has made it out. Yes. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) With husband-shaped memories. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And so she knows it's possible for something me-shaped to make it out of this. Yeah. So she's the only one that has any kind of positive outlook on this situation. Everybody else is like, no, this is a suicide mission. Yeah. Right. And we were talking about why I thought this movie would be palatable to you. Oh, yes. Uh, Okay. So I watched this with a group of guys. uh, And then I was like, okay, this was good. Um, Rachel would probably like it because there's no stupid characters. Yeah. Yeah, if there's a stu- yeah, even any movie where somebody makes a really poor decision, I have a hard time working through it. As as a plot device almost. As a plot device. Right. Yeah, if it's character if it's character if I feel like that fits that character, it's fine. They can make they can be the dumb character that I'm angry at the whole character. But like in there's several movies that are otherwise great, but they have the characters make totally out of character decisions in order to drive the plot forward. And that will kick me out every single time. But if you had to pick one single word to describe this movie, I'd go with surreal. Yes. Surreal and visually striking. <laughs> <laughs> Which I feel like... If it's you, a visually striking thriller. If you had to say, well, what kind of movies do Matt and Rachel like? And you could only pick two things. Surreal and visually striking would probably about sum it up. Which is probably why we like it so much. There is so much use of the filming itself as a way of driving the surreal feeling and creating a feeling of wholeness in the entire movie. The way the like soft light is used in the entire movie. The light is really nice in this movie and it, it kind of uh, ties everything together. Yeah. Everything feels coherent. Yeah. Yeah. Because the, because the use of light is so well done. In this entire movie. Pretty much every scene either has a light bloom, which is where the the camera sensor gets saturated and bleeds around to the uh, pixels around it. Yeah. Um, Or there's a bright light off screen that's casting light into the scene. Right. Or refracted light. Almost like an oil sheen on every light. Yeah. And I'm wondering, I I was wondering how, how they did it in some of the scenes where it's directly around the characters it's fine like it look everything looks pretty normal but then like the mist around them has like a rainbow hue to it yeah once they're okay so the basic plot of the movie since we're not going through the synopsis anymore we can still sort of broad stroke it and natalie portman's character is a doctor at johns hopkins and her husband is in the military Uh, we don't ever get specifically what he does in the military because I think she doesn't know specifically. It's a very top secret. He's special ops of some form. And he has disappeared a year previous. And she has decided this weekend to paint the bedroom because she hasn't let him go. She hasn't let him go partly because she's so guilty, feels so guilty about the fact that she was having an affair, which takes us a long time to unpack, and that he found out about it, and he took a risky, self-destructive mission because he knew that she had um, imploded their marriage for no real reason. And he comes back. He shows up. Right. He's been gone for a year. He's been gone for a year, and he she just stopped shows up. asking uh, yeah. the military about like status updates for him six months ago. Yeah. And, but she's like, there's been no body. There's been no official like death report. So she still has this little piece of hope that he'll come back one day. Yeah. But she's kind of accepted it. Uh, Until he shows up at her door. Boom. Boom. He's coming up the stairs. And it's Oscar Isaac. Yep. Of which we don't get much of him. No, considering, well, I guess this is 2018. So... Yeah, this was before, um, I guess, a lot of his big recent roles, like Dune, and uh, he was in Moon Knight. And yeah. 
This is right. We're at the the beginning of his fame. This wave. is like an inflection point in his yeah, career. Yeah. And he doesn't know how he got there. He doesn't know where he's been. He knows that he recognized her. Right. He woke up. He recognized her face because he was standing in the doorway. Yeah. And he goes, well, I was standing outside. She goes, standing outside where? He goes, outside the door. Outside the door to what? Outside the door to the room with the bed in it. He literally only remembers the moment he was outside the door and he remembered her. And he takes a drink from this glass of water. And when he puts it down, there's blood in it. And he's like, I don't think I'm feeling very well. Oh, so there was a cool element here, visually, where the cup of water is in the middle of the table and the camera's right behind it. And you can see their hands through it. And they do this, um, they use this two or three times. Yeah. Anytime they have a, it's like a glass of water because there's no ice in it. So we can get this effect. Right. You get the like reversal yeah. of their hands and it kind of, imp- they use it when somebody's realizing Shit's I misunderstood, I'm, I'm misunderstanding the situation and I need to like back up and reassess. Yeah. And so she calls the, calls 911 and he's in the. He's in the ambulance. He's in the ambulance and shit's going sideways. And black vans He's just like show coughing up. up blood. Yeah, he's seizing and hemorrhaging. And these black vans show up and they pull him out and they sedate her. And when she wakes up, we get our first title card. We get three title cards. And our first title card is Area X. And so that's where we're at now. Or they call it the Southern Reach. Right. And the this, organization is Southern Reach. This is where we get our very perfunctory... Uh, like info dump on yeah. like what's this movie going to be all about and it's about the shimmer so three years ago this thing came from space this thing we don't know what it is we right. never uh, we, know we what it see is. it in the oh, the opening scene of the movie right is this meteorite this thing crashing on the uh at into this lighthouse and so the first clue that things aren't normal yeah is that there's this I don't know, basketball sized meteorite that hits this lighthouse and there's no crater. No. Right? Something that big hitting Earth from orbit would leave a pretty big crater, right. knock down the whole lighthouse, but just pokes a little hole in it and yeah. And then starts this shimmer effect. Right. And that was three years ago. And now the aura, the perimeter of the shimmer has gotten much much bigger it's growing over time and it's literally this perimeter of like oil sheen that you can see it's like a a wall and they don't know what it is they don't know what's inside of it they don't know what's causing it and everyone they've sent into it has died or hasn't come back right and the they just keep sending people into it because that's what we do <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's not innovate. Let's just keep sending different teams and see which possible combination might might work because communications are not getting out. They know that. Right. So you can't send like a probe that's going to send back information because it can't send back information. And you can't direct a probe. It would have to be totally autonomous. So it has to be people right. that you send in there. And so they're putting together a team. And But this team's different. But this team's different somehow well they're all women but yeah they're all women right none of them are military well natalie says natalie portman lena's character is like oh this team is all women and they're like no we're all scientists that's which i thought was really interesting because no we would not in any way comment if it was an all-male team right um but this particular team happens to be all female i'm not sure if that was their specific purpose or if it was just because this particular set of skills Every single one who had it was a woman because they're sending in a physicist and a geo. What is she? The blonde Uh, lady. Geomagnetologist or something. Yeah. She's studying the magnetic field around, um, which isn't helping. Like she's not learning anything basically. And then they're sending in a paramedic, which must just be for medical emergencies. Yeah. Although Natalie Portman is a doctor. Like a medical doctor. She's not, she's more of a researcher. Well, she's a biologist. She's a biologist. She describes herself as a biologist. She's a PhD biologist. And a psychologist. Yes. Yes. But the psychologist is 
doing it more because, well, th- we find out they have cancer, so they're going to die anyway. Yeah. And, but they've had to watch all of these other teams go in. And never come and out. And never hear from and them And they've again. had to, she has had to interact with. Right. She and profile selects the and teams. And selects the teams. So all and of so these people that she's had sent to. Sent to their death. Like, um, she's had to get to know them personally. Yeah. To evaluate whether they're a good fit for the team. And all these people that she personally evaluated and sent out are gone. Yeah. And so there's probably a lot of survivor guilt there. Yeah. And she just, she needs to know. And I have problems with this character. Ventress is the psychologist. Right. The They play her very deadpan. I can't tell if I don't like this character because I don't like the actress that they picked for it. Because I don't like the way she played it. Or because the character themselves is unlikable. I can't tell which one it is. I don't know if she's doing a great job and that's why I don't like right. her. Or if I don't like her. Just because she's not doing a good job? I can't I, figure it I out. I got and, the feeling that she was doing a great job following the director's instructions because she for how to play the character. Unlikable. Like aggressively unlikable. Not in a combative way, but in a totally checked out, totally disassociated from what she's doing way. Every time she's actually con- conversing with anyone, she's fidgeting. She's playing with a pen. She's doodling. She's like playing with stuff in her hands. She's never fully paying attention to anything that's happening. And she has no inflection. And she's extremely negative and deadpan and fatalistic. And it's an extremely difficult character for me. Okay. So here's here's my take on that. I think she's supposed to be challenging for people to interact with because that makes it easy for... I guess that that way of acting um, makes it easier for her to provoke a reaction out of the person that she's interacting with. Yeah. Which is good if you're trying to evaluate how people are going to react psycholo- psychologically um, in a stressful situation. Yeah. Is you put them in front of a stressful, stressful person. person. Yeah. She's stressful. She would stress me out. Right. And so she keeps responding with questions or very like – the most negative interpretation of what you said yeah, to see what you do. Plus she's been there for three years. I mean, I think she's right. And she's dying of cancer, which we mentioned um, once. And I don't know. She's just that. That's usually my problem with this movie is I can't figure out where, where this character slash actor slash role fits. Um, But regardless, she's not in it that much. Natalie Portman's doing a good job. Everybody else is doing a great job. In this movie. So it's okay. It's a very um, pensive movie. We are allowed to steep in each um, sort of plot beat that we go through. And I think that works extremely well. I think if we tried to rush through this, we would have missed the artistry of the way the filming itself almost becomes a character. Because once we're in the shimmer, the setting is as much a character as the characters themselves. Because they had to convey through the setting the beautiful deterioration that is caused by whatever this thing was that landed in the in the lighthouse. Right. And it's kind of a an exploration of here's this thing that is completely unknown. And there are amazingly horrific aspects to what is happening in here but there are also really beautiful things happening it's a beautiful deterioration because there's this sort of rainbow sheen to everything or they come across this vine and this vine is one species one vine but it's literally producing all these beautiful, vibrantly colored flowers that are all, clustered all different. together. And they're all different. Because this field, the shimmer, is not just refracting light. It is refracting everything, including genetic possibility. Including memories. Including everything, yeah. yeah. It breaks everything apart into its component pieces and recombines it. Which is a really cool... Like, So we get... 
we spend a whole bunch of time just going through and getting exposed to all the weird things that are happening. And then the, oh, the shimmer is a prism, but it refracts everything. Everything. Like, okay. Wow. That was like really, that's a really elegant way of con conveying um, or explaining everything that we've seen so far. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And we set ourselves up as soon as the team gets together. And she, Lena, who is ostensibly our main character, hasn't told anybody that Kane or Oscar Isaacs, the, the one person that everybody knows came back from the Shimmer, but is dying. She doesn't tell them that this guy is her husband. She's deliberately hiding that fact because she doesn't want it to affect how they interact. Right. So they go into the shimmer and then we cut to a flashback, which we do a lot of. I really like how we have almost three elements here. We have her dreams. We have flashbacks. We have in the shimmer. And we kind of interweave all of these and it gives us a break. If we were just in the shimmer, the entire second two thirds of the movie, last two thirds of the movie, it would feel overwhelming because the shimmer itself is so overwhelming. Right. You'd get like numbed to it. You'd get fatigued, but yeah. we get to go back to the real world, and then go back. So it continues so that contrast. And uh, in the shimmer, all the colors are more saturated, right? And then anytime we're outside of the shimmer, it's almost like everything is deliberately um, suppressed color wise. Yeah. Yes, and so we walk through the shimmer. Oh, except for her memories. Yes, so she gets her memory. We get a memory, and then she wakes up in a tent. And this is our immediate establishing of the fact that everything is going to feel surreal in the shimmer, including the timeline. Right. They don't know how long they've been there, except that according to their rations, it could have been as much as four days already. Right, and I think this is really valuable plot-wise because it justifies why literally nobody has come back. Even if, because it, if they they walked through the wall and then boom, they all wake up in their tents. Yeah. Even if you were like, okay, you two people, you're just going to, you're going to carry the camera. You're going to walk through the shimmer. You're going to take 10 steps and you're going to walk right back out. You couldn't do it. They may have even attempted that. Yeah. But it didn't work. Right. Because as soon as you're in, you're in. You're gone. You have to like acclimate to it. Yeah. And we get our first. And it's very reminiscent of when Kane showed up at the house. Yeah. And he's like, I don't know. I was all of a sudden I was here and I recognized you. Right. Yeah. And we get our first kind of monster and it's a crocodile and it attacks the physicist. Yep. And Grabs externally, it, it looks like a uh, super crocodile. crocodile? <laughs> But they shoot it with uh, a lot of bullets. And or it's, it's, a, it's an alligator. It's an alligator. But it has like multiple different kinds of sets of teeth. It's got a right, It has mouth. sharp teeth. Yeah. It's, again, refracted, changed. Um, sometimes horrifically, like the super alligator. And sometimes beautifully, like later we get to see some deer whose antlers are flowers. Right. Or long flower stalks. And I love that we didn't go just monster with this. Right. That it is horrific what is happening. This entire natural world is getting deconstructed and refracted and recombined. But that doesn't mean that every combination is horrific. Right. That, that's a really nice part of this movie. Yeah. Is because they went, if you completely disconnect the kind of natural growth of things, the natural... Um, development of things yeah. and just randomly mix things together. Yes. Yeah, sometimes you get boring stuff. Sometimes you get really horrific things yeah. like the bear. We're going to get to the bear or are we going to fucking get to the bear? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and sometimes you get really beautiful things like the deer with flower antlers or the, the human shaped plants. Yeah. Yep. Which were, as we get deeper into the shimmer, the more things begin to fall apart. The more notable, the more evident the effects the more, of the shimmer. Yeah, the more have become. extreme the Because the longer are. they've been in there. Because it's expanding out in an outs in a circle. Right. 
in a sphere, really, which has lots of implications. But I'm just going to leave that there. Um, yeah, so we get to the military base, which is the previous location for the Southern Reach, which was swallowed by the Shimmer years ago. And they decide they're going to stay in the mess hall. And they find that other people have stayed in the mess hall. So the last the last mission. Yeah, previous teams. They just say bags and packs. They don't tell you how many. We don't know how many missions have made it this far. That's a good point. And then this is as far as they made it. And they find an SD card. Right. And so this is our first kind of foray into like traditional. Um, I mean, we had the uh, crocodile. Well, I mean, like we had conventional like gore horror. Yeah, we had environmental horror. The big monster. The first big monster. Right. And then we have our body horror, which is this video is of, and this is gross, a man getting his stomach cut open so that we can see his intestine. But it's not intestines. It's like moving and slithering. Right. It's really thick and it's all sliding around. Yeah, and we see Kane, which this is a video of Kane and Kane's team. We see Kane actually stick his hand underneath one of the intestine pieces and, it and it's sliding over his, over hand. his hand. And they immediately turn it off. Which I'm um, okay, it's gross. I get it. But was there more on the tape? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we never go back and look. They're just there like, might be, ah, there might be some useful information." Right. There. We just check out immediately, which okay, it's gross. I'm not saying it's not gross, but was that the, I mean, how much footage was on there? They could have kept watching. There could have been more information that they could have gleaned from this tape, but they're all just so grossed out. Which, I mean, at this point, they've been in the shimmer for question mark. They don't know how long. And we don't know. They could have already started the process of mental deterioration that would have prevented them from thinking that through. They end up going to the pool, the like empty pool. Where, where the video was recorded. Where the video was recorded. And the guy is um, still there? His his body... Ish? Ish is there. Yeah, it's... Um, his body has uh, bloomed. It has become something different and yeah, more. Yeah, whatever was in his belly grew... And became and something And pushed else. the top half of his body up about six feet. Yeah. It's yeah. a lot. I mean, it's a lot. And... They end up leaving. They don't stay. They stay at the base, but they go into this elevated guard post, uh, almost like an air traffic tower. It, it's it's a like it's a watchtower. Yeah, to sleep the night. Uh, but when they this is the one part that I thought, hmm, okay, because instead of putting our watches in the watchtower, the person who's on watch goes down, down into the long level. grass, into a concrete bunker thing. Which right. isn't even really a bunker thing. It's like a right. It, it's, it's like, like a guard station or, with no uh, windows. It reminded me of like a little stall at a market. Yeah. Where you have like a countertop around the perimeter. Yeah, completely. It, but it's open, undefensible, not elevated. <laughs> bad choice. Okay. Right. Not bad choice. So for some reason, they have decided that whoever's on watch is going to be down there instead of. And, it, and they have night vision goggles. They could have been up in the guard tower right. scanning the fence line with the night vision. Anyway. It's, I think. Uh, okay. So I think so they we, did this just so. We can meet the Ven bear. Well, I think. Yeah. So Ventress and Lena can have time to talk to each other about the secrets that Lena has been keeping from the rest of the group. Yeah. In a place that nobody's going to overhear them. Right. Plus it, it ramps up the terror because this is our first introduction to the bear the bear and let me tell you the bear the, the bear is hands down the scariest fucking monster i have ever seen in a horror in movie in any movie ever i have i've watched a fair number of horror movies in my time and the most of them i am not it's not a scary experience it's a entertaining experience it's Fun, funny, um, mildly traumatizing, but this bear haunts me. <laughs> this <laughs> bear is terrifying. And when we first meet it, it's just a bear. I mean, it's a big bear. It's a big fucking bear. Right. We but, just see it through the night vision goggles dragging 
um, shepherd away. Shepherd away. Yeah. And so it gets the one of the characters and shepherd and drags her away. And she never has a chance. They never catch up with her because they all hear something break through the fence. And instead of staying in the guard tower, they all come down to the long grass and the indefensible. They all come out with guns drawn. That's true. That is true. But the bear just grabs her and runs off. And she's screaming, help me, and screaming. And it's scary. But it, at this point, it's really just another environmental horror. Right. Like the giant crocodile. It's a giant bear. Right. Oh, it's okay. a natural horror. It's just a, a monster. Right? Yeah. And we get an interesting conversation here with Ventress where she's talking about She's talking to Lena. This is right before the bear. But this, I feel like this is one of the central plots of the movie. So kind of need to discuss it. And it's that um, Lena has asked, she asks Ventress, why did my husband volunteer for this? Why would he volunteer for a suicide mission? Oh, right. Yeah. Suicide. And Ventress says, you are confusing self-destruction with suicide. Almost nobody commits suicide, but almost all of us self-destruct. And she says, it, in, in anything, we smoke, we drink. We, we ruin the good job. We ru- Yeah, we, we destabilize the good job. We implode the happy marriage. And she just looks at Lena like, you Implying know. Implying that Ventress you, knows from Cain yeah. that Lena had an affair. Yeah, but I really liked the, you are confusing suicide with self-destruction. Because earlier in the movie, we had talked to, uh, they were discussing God. And uh, Lena and Cain, in a flashback, were talking about God and how God doesn't make mistakes. And so Lena says, you know, we don't actually have to age. Literally, destruction is built into our cells. It's a fault in our genes. Right, and her specialty as a biologist is the programmed life cycle, life of, the cycle of the cell yeah and she was discussing that yeah self-destruction is built into all of us and we get a lot of subtle hints because we're also seeing lena who has escaped the shimmer and she is telling right. us the story of what is happening in the shimmer or she's telling you know the people at the base right. she's getting interviewed she's getting right. debriefed and at one point she looks down and scratches her arm and she has this figure eight tattoo on it right which Right after the alligator, um, she's she looks at her arm and she's like, oh, I have a little bruise. I must have gotten that from the alligator. Right. But that's the start of this tattoo showing up, which I think it's from... Alma. Alma, yeah. It's from one of the other... Characters. Groups. Yeah. Uh, one of the other people in her group, they have, the, they have a tattoo on their arm and it's slowly showing up on Lena's arm. Which a tattoo is not genetic. But it, it's not just genetic. It's body parts oh, refracting. Oh, yes. It's everything. They are all becoming each other. Yeah, they're all mixing. And um, we see an extreme form of that in the video at the lighthouse where- Yeah, far later. Um, there's a video of Kane, maybe, maybe But they've not. all become Kane. Right. They all look the same. Or at least another party, another person in Kane's group has- come to look exactly like Kane. Right. But he has a different accent. Right. He has yeah. a different accent. Yep. Anyway. All right. So. Yeah. So after we leave the Southern Reach, I was I was reorienting myself. So we leave the abandoned Southern Reach and we're all a little bit more morose. I mean, they've all been a little bit frightened up to this point, but nobody had died. Right. Shit was a little weird, but there was still the possibility they could all get out. And now Shepard has died. And they're all handling it a little bit differently, but Alma is handling it the worst. Alma or Anya? Anya, sorry. Okay. Anya. Uh, before they leave, there's a confrontation in the what, the top room in the watchtower where Ventress is like, we're going to this town that was evacuated. Oh, yeah. And Anya's like, no, no we're, we're going getting back. the fuck out. Yeah. And... uh. And Ventress is like, uh, well, then I'm going by myself. Yeah. And she's like, well, thanks for the fucking backup, Lena. And, and Lena's, Lena's like, like what? what? Lena's like, what? I'm sorry. I wasn't listening. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, were we arguing? She was having a Nick Knight moment. Yeah. And she's like, <laughs> Lena. <laughs> she was. <laughs> she really was. Because <laughs> she was lost in her thoughts about Kane and all that was happening and right. implications. So, and- so Lena's like, oh, 
Oh, yeah, I, I agree with you. We need to get out. But. Plot twist. I think the best way out is the way that Ventress is going yeah, to the coast. To the coast and then we follow the coastline the coast out. And go south. Yeah, because they don't, they're, nothing's working. The compass doesn't work. The GPS doesn't work. They can kind of use their watches. Shepherd, they can orient with the sun. Yeah, but uh, nothing is reliable. Everything is refracted. They're in a prism. They can't rely on it. So the only thing they could, they could rely on a landmark. They could right. walk to the edge of the water and walk along the water. And so that's what Lena suggests. And we go back to the Lena that is telling the story. And they ask her, did you really believe that? Why'd you lie to them? And she goes, well, I didn't really lie. I didn't know what leaving the prison, I didn't know what leaving the shimmer meant. I didn't know why going back would somehow be better than going forward. Right, because for her... This isn't just an information gathering mission. Yeah. This is searching for a cure and maybe an explanation about her husband. Right. And at this point, she has looked at her own blood and realized it's that inside of her. They're all being affected by it. They're all being changed by being in the shimmer. So there's no going back. They're they're infected effectively. Right. And they go to the nearest town, which this is mostly unpopulated swampland. Um, but there was one town, and they had um, evacuated it years prior. Uh, so there are, theoretically, nobody there. But when they get there, these there's these really beautiful, tr- like, flower statues of people. Kids right, and it's left hold- ambiguous and it's, yeah. about whether it's people that turned into plants or plants that just... Grew like people. Grew in the shape of people. Yeah, because of the DNA that was left behind and how all of our DNA contains the code for what we're supposed to look like. The body structure. Yeah, your body structure. And this is when they really kind of start to figure out what what this shit is, like what's happening. This is when we start to put some of the pieces together. Right, this is when um, the physicist, I forget what her name is. um, Reddick. Yeah, Raddick. 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 Uh, this is when she the Valkyrie, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which this came out right after Thor, yeah. Um, which was like a huge contrast in character. She's for a her. very different character. Yes, in this. yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, yeah, this is where she says the line that the the shimmer is a prism for everything, yeah. not just a light. It refracts light. It reflects refracts radio waves, which is why none of their communications can get out. Right, it's not blocking it. It's just and it breaks apart and recombines it. everything, anything. It doesn't care what it puts together. It can put plants and body people, parts, memories, all of it. Yeah. And this is where we get our first glimpse because Anya, up to this point, everyone had kind of been like we were sad, but we weren't antagonistic towards each other, kind of. But we're really starting to reach a point where. At least one member of the party is not okay. She's about to snap. She's about to snap. And so we go to a house. We're going to stay in this house. And everybody falls asleep. And we get another flashback. Uh, well, And while they're, while they're trekking, uh, they find like a bloody piece of clothing. Oh, yes. From Shepard. Yeah, they find her, her boot. Yeah. And so Lena actually goes and tracks down Shepard to make yeah, sure. follows the trail. Just to make sure. sure she's actually dead. They're not leaving a teammate behind who's alive. And she is. She's gone. And her, her throat's been ripped out and she's clearly deceased. But only Lena saw it. Right. Because she didn't want anybody else to see it. She was probably attempting to protect them from whatever she was expecting to find. Which, right. But that means that Lena is the only one who saw Shepard get taken. And Lena is the only one who saw Shepard dead. Right. And we get a dream sequence here. And this is the one where she's reading the book about the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks. (laughs) Which, uh, in the first scene that we see her, she's lecturing to her class about, there's a video of these cells dividing. And she's talking about these cells that were taken from a woman's cervix. And... um, and they're immortal. Yeah. They're HeLa cells. Henrietta Lacks. Yep. Which, that's a whole other thing I encourage Ooh. everyone to learn about. Yeah. Because Look it up. It's on Wikipedia. It's wild. Wild. Pretty much and... every, like, initial human 
drug test where you say, oh, how do human cells react with this? Well, every lab all over the world has HeLa cells. And it's like, okay, put some HeLa cells in a dish and wait for them to divide a little bit so we get enough culture. And then we can add something and see what happens. Yep. But the sample profile is always Henrietta Lacks. Henrietta Lacks. Look it up. It's really, really fascinating. But anyway, now what we're discussing right okay. now. <laughs> while, we're, while we're back in the classroom. Oh, let's do this. Uh, she's talking about um, how life first developed. Yeah. With, as a single cell and it multiplied and blah, blah, blah. And four billion years later, we have humans. And I saw a video uh, from Hank Green. And he's talking about this um, thing that nobody ever really mentions about uh, like a, an individual's uh, lifespan mm -hmm. in the universe is tiny. Yeah. Infinitesimal. The life, the time span that humans have been on, on the earth is inconsequential. But if you look at it from i am the um i am the result of 4 billion years of life on earth i i am yeah the most recent link in the chain of life all the way that originated with the first single cell organism that time span is somewhere between 3 and a half and 4 billion years which is about 27% of the lifetime of the universe. The entire universe. And so that, to say, to say I'm part of this uh, biological chain of events that has lasted more than a quarter of the lifetime of the universe. Yeah. Is uh, wild. a lot more impactful. Yeah. Well, it's good you gave us that moment of rest because we're about to find the bear again. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Because... <laughs> Uh, they get Back woken to the up. Trauma. Oh my god! They get woken up um, by Anya, who has lost her shit, and she's tied them all up. And in chairs. she's tied them all up in chairs because she doesn't believe that Shepard really died, and she found the locket that Natalie Portman was wearing that had her husband's picture in it, and she recognizes the picture, and she recognizes that this is the soldier that survived, and she is not okay. She's not been okay, but now she's not okay in a homicidal way. <laughs> and then we start to hear, then we start to hear from outside. Help me! Shepherd screaming, screaming. Help me. And Anya is immediately like, oh. She's not dead. She's not dead. Lena was lying I'm this whole time. I'm coming. I I'm was trying right. to help you. So she runs outside. Well, it was the bear screaming, help me, in Shepherd's voice. Because part of Shepard became part of the bear, and it can use her voice. And then the bear comes in the room. And, and it's blind. And we get this, it's blind, yeah, it doesn't have eyes. We get this long, long, it feels like, oh my God, it is so suspenseful it because they can't so react. so slowly. Yes. And it's only, it's only navigating by, like, sound. Not and, even smell. And every time it... All the all the tissue off the top half of its skull is gone. Yeah. So it probably can't smell anything, uh, but it can hear. Yeah. yeah, and it relies on them reacting. So if they don't react, they're going to be okay. But this giant fucking bear, and every time it opens its mouth, they can hear the distorted sound of their friend's voice screaming for help. Right, her her death cry. Oh my god. This bear is uh, I this is just perfect. I mean, this It's so well executed. It is so well done. And in a movie where really the fear, the horror itself comes from the situation. The right. vast majority of the time, the the mystery and the surrealness and the hauntedness of the situation we're in is where we get the majority of our horror. This is our only real monster. They had to fucking nail this monster. 
and they fucking nail this monster. It is perfect. It is horrifying. It is perfect. Perfect. And the first time you watch it, I mean, it li- literally, this will stick with you. Every time you think about a horror movie monster that's terrifying, you're going to be like, oh my God, that fucking bear. <laughs> it is so <laughs> scary. Uh, and Radic is the one who ends up killing it because it's going for Lena. Um, Anya comes back in and she tries to shoot it, but she's injured and she can't quite shoot straight. Right, the bear is right in Radic's face. Yeah. It and puts it, its mouth on her shoulder. It right, literally, probably trying to figure out if she's food. Yeah, it literally bites her shoulder, like holds its teeth on her shoulder, but not biting her. Get trying to get her to react. And that's when Anya comes in and starts shooting it. And, and so it barrels in between of Radic and Lena. Yeah, and Lena's chair is broken. Them out of their chairs. She's yeah. trying to get out of it. Anyway, it, we kill the bear. So this is the end of the bear. Which is good, which is good, because I feel like if we'd kept going too long with the bear, we would have worn out our shiny. We would have. Right, right. If they had just escaped from the bear and then tried to, like, keep us, keep us going with, oh, they're getting stalked by the bear now. Because that would have been too much. The horror was in this big reveal in the help me. And then finding out that the bear was the one screaming. That's all. That's a complete packet of horror. And if we had tried to, to spread that out. It would not have worked. It would have been butter over too much bread. Yeah. It would have been too much. So it's perfect. It ends right here. And then when we come back to um, sort of our being able to have plot, we're not in our action segment anymore. We're back. Ventress is leaving. It's dark, but she doesn't care. She's leaving because her whole purpose was to get to this lighthouse and they're falling apart and she can't wait. Right. On even his one more moment. Down, um, yeah. Gives her a timeline. Yeah, like they're all, this is going to happen to all of them soon. And so she needs to go and do what she needs to do right now. And so she's headed to the lighthouse. And Lena and Radic don't go with her because it's dark. It's it. This is Ventress's moment of self-destruction. It isn't their moment of self-destruction. And so she leaves. And then when we come back in the morning, Radic is a much calmer character than she has been previously. And she's no longer wearing her long sleeve shirt. Which we get a momentary glimpse of the fact that she has a lot of scars on the inside of her forearm. Right, and we'd mentioned it earlier in the movie. Yeah, that she had gone through a lot and that she bore the scars of the things that she had gone through. Right. Um, and so she is actually taking pieces of flower, pieces of plant. Well, um, to as, as perspective on Radic's uh, situation... Um, I really liked the scene where Lena and Shepard are in the canoe. Oh, yeah. And they're they're just floating along, having this slow conversation about really deep things. Yeah. And that's when Shepard mentions, oh, yeah, she has, you know, she wears long sleeves to hide all the scars on her arms. Yeah. Um, and And Lena says, oh, trying to kill herself? And she's like, no, I, I, think I think it's the opposite. Try, yeah, I think it's the opposite. She's trying, trying to, to feel alive. alive. Yeah, and I think a, a lot of. Uh, um, never mind. Where was I going with that? Oh yeah. So now, Radic is not worried about people seeing her arms. Right, because she has come to a place where she realizes that Ventress wants to destroy it, destroy the shimmer. Lena wants to understand it, but she doesn't want either one of those things. She just wants to be a part of it. This, She sees the right. beauty of what has happened. She's accepted that this wouldn't be so bad. Yeah. And to so, be a beautiful result of this kind of just chaotic mixing of things. Yeah, this entropy. And so she takes pieces of flower and plant and she's putting it in each of her scars. I'm, I wasn't sure if she was inserting them into I think her she is because the first time I watched it I thought that that was just happening but I think what she's actually doing is because she realizes that the joining of the bear and shepherd was because they were they were proximity. connected the proximity they touched because the bear bit shepherd it was able to absorb part of her right it and amplifies so, the 
She wants, she has realized that this is the end for all of them already. They're already infected. The shimmer is never going to let them go in the way that they walked into the shimmer. And so the only thing she has left is to choose the way that she choose what happens to her. And so she doesn't want anything else to be able to make that choice. She doesn't want to run into another bear and find herself part of like the fear and terror of her last moment is the only thing that's left of her. Right. This is her exercising her agency. Yeah. This is the only choice she has left, which is what do I become? And so she takes the pieces of plant and I think she puts, she actually puts them because this time when I saw it, you actually see there's like, like blood, like she's actually inserted okay. this plant into her body so that it will become part of her and she will become part of it. And we don't actually see that happen. She starts As she's to walk walking away. away, we cut, we cut away and back to her walking away like yeah. three times. And each time There's she has more, more flowers out of more her green, all over yeah. the place. Uh, she's becoming one of these plant sculptures as she's walking away, but she walks kind of out of frame behind Around this the corner. bush. And when Lena catches up, she's we, gone. We can't see her. She's gone. She's in this field with all these other people shaped plants. And now it's Lena. She's alone. Ventress is gone. Radic is gone. Anya's dead. Shepard is dead. And so the only thing she has left is to go to the coast, to go to the lighthouse. And so that's what she does. And if you thought this shit was surreal before, welcome to the fucking lighthouse. <laughs> <laughs> Crystal trees. Crystal. The, yes. I, this whole movie feels like artwork like moving artwork especially once we're in the shimmer because they had to come up with this imagery that would feel both beautiful but horrific at the same time because right. it hits you right in that wow that looks really cool but holy shit how did that get there it hits you right in that like right and and they do such a good job of um making it a gradual thing yeah. Right. When you first get there, oh, there's multiple different kinds of flowers growing oh, on okay, the same thing. Okay, well, that's thing. weird. Yeah. Oh, the um, crocodile. No, the alligator. Yeah. Um, the alligator. The water monster <laughs> of has, some description. Yeah. You know, the alligator's teeth, um, sorry, its teeth have been replaced by shark teeth. Yeah. Right. So it's kind of similar being replaced with similar yeah but then every every step deeper into the shimmer is more extreme and the the way they executed that was it's really well done yeah 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 it hits you right in that sweet spot of like surreal horror this the surrealness the feeling of out of placeness becomes the horror itself and crystal trees get that i mean we get some skulls we get some rib cages we get some bones if we didn't have those it'd still be a horrific setting it'd be fine you could throw a shoe in there it wouldn't fucking matter right. it's still terrifying and she just walks in the door to the lighthouse and this is when we get the parts of the puzzle that we're never going to get in a good explanation for which is intentional it's right. purposeful. And that, I love it because it's purposeful. If they had attempted to wrap it up, but just didn't know what the fuck was going on because they did such a heavy-handed job trying, trying to wrap it up, it would have ruined this movie. But they're just like, okay, well, we haven't explained anything up till now, so don't expect us to explain <laughs> anything now. Uh, we see a burned body with like a flash mark on the wall behind it. Yeah, with scorch around it. And there's a hole a dark hole going somewhere going somewhere and there's these vines almost coming up all around the hole and there's a camcorder pointed at the burned body and this is when we get our cane and cane we, the video is of a guy who says i think i used to be cane but maybe i wasn't right i i dreamed that i used to be a man called cane do you know who i am maybe you know me and it's just this really bizarre one-sided conversation and then we get a question and answer where he right, says. And then we realize, oh, there's someone behind the camera. Yeah. And he says, make sure if you see Lena, if you see Lena, tell her I love her. And he goes, I will. But it's also Kane. It's Kane right. and Kane. And so the body guy, the guy who becomes the body that we see. Right. He, opens a flash grenade. Yep. And burns himself. 
And then we see Kane come around the camera and turn the camera off. And that's, and she just is like, I can't handle this. And then she hears something coming from the hole and it's Ventress. And so she goes down the hole to find out what Ventress is doing, which bold because this hole is really freaky. <laughs> I'd be like, are you okay down there? <laughs> She's just like, oh, I'm going down. And when we first get down there, Ventress doesn't have eyes. Did you notice that? Yes. Yeah. And she's yeah, just. Yeah, she's kind of pontificating. Yeah, it really. I mean, at this point, you just got to watch it. I can't replicate any of this dialogue because this is just, all of it is to give you tiny, what feels like pieces of truth. Right. We're in this. This is the first time it feels alien. Yes. And this room is weirdly shaped and it has these, it might be like forced perspective or something like that, but it. It reminds me of like visualization visualizations I've seen of what it would be like in like a hypercube, like a uh, four dimensional space that you have to navigate through. Cube and, too. Hypercube. <laughs> <laughs> Karen with Davies is in that. He is? Yeah. <laughs> Why do you think I've seen it? <laughs> I haven't even seen the original cube. <laughs> oh, so this is like everything up till now is like, oh, like, we're still on Earth. It's just no. everything's mixed together weird. We have dropped off the motherfucking deep but end. But now yes. she went into this hole, and n now we don't even feel like we're on Earth. No. This is a completely alien room. Yeah. And everything's, like, fractal-shaped. Yes. And Ventress turns to look at her, and she looks like Ventress again. Yeah. And... She says something about, like, we're all going to be broken apart into our smallest pieces until nothing remains. And that will be Annihilation, which is where we get the title of the movie from. Yeah. And then she goes a little bit extra and just vomits light all over the place. <laughs> yeah. De deflates like a balloon. Like, right. she was filled with light, and then she vomits all this light up and becomes nothing. It, it takes every part of her. And then this light coalesces into a ball. Which this, this like gets turning, a, yeah, fractal turning fractal almost thing. thing, and this gets a little um, how do I birth imagery because we have <laughs> this egg almost right, this yeah. really creepy, which we're getting our like sci fi music, right? This is the first time we've had, like, yeah, the, up till now, the bass tones, yeah, up till now, they they've yeah. they've given us some folksy music, we've had a little guitar we've had a little whatever some surreal like the buzzing like the low buzzing they'll do sometimes when they really want you to feel disturbed um but we haven't had our like base our sci-fi base this is our first yeah. sci-fi base moment and she's staring at this thing this being that has coalesced it we don't even know if it's sentience we can't really call it a being but right. this thing that has coalesced in the middle and she provides genetic material it pulls a drop of blood out of a cut on her nose. On the bridge of her nose, yeah. And it goes into this, it's not an egg, but let's call it an egg. She donates genetic material to this egg, and it becomes her. Well, it becomes a thing. It becomes a physical body that is reminiscent of Natalie Portman's body. And so she's like, oh, fucking nope. And she <laughs> she dips out the hole. She's like, and I'm gone. But by the time she gets out of the hole, the thing is standing out there. Right. And then we get. This is our, this is, this is almost as freaky as the bear. This thing, this humanoid thing, because at first it's mirroring, it's watching her to mirror her. Right. Um, let me think. There was a, there was another movie that did this. Um, where you, okay, so there was a a creature that was identical to the character, and it was every time they moved, it copied them on a delay, and then oh, the as more, time they got closer and the more closer they together, did it, the Doctor the Who. shorter it was a Doctor delay Who episode, got, and then it was the one with the voice. The voice. Remember, he would say something, and then they'd hear the echo of the voice, and then it got closer and closer together until the voices were speaking at the same time. 
Oh, yes. And he was like, stop speaking. That was the one where they were on that the, diamond yeah, planet. This was the elevator episode. Yeah, it was the one yeah. where they were on the train on the diamond episode. Yeah, a thing possessed the character. Yeah. And then it was mimicking the doctor. Yeah. And then they got to where they were speaking at exactly the same time. And then it was speaking first and the doctor was speaking second. Speaking second. Yes. And so that's kind of what that reminded me of. Yeah. But I couldn't remember the exact scene. Right. That's, yeah. We love you, David Tennant. We're so glad you're back. <laughs> um, yeah, this whole part's freaky. It mirrors her until she attempts to escape. And when she attempts right. to escape, it almost suffocates her by pushing her against the door. Right. And then it kind of drops around the ground and it drops into the, it gets into the same position. And it, they're mirroring each other. And it's right. continuing to mirror her, but now it doesn't need to see her. It can just do what she's doing without having to look at her. Right. And Natalie figures this out pretty quickly. Lena. Matt called this Dark Lena. Lena and Dark Lena. Right. She uh, figures this out which pretty is, quickly. Uh, I, I told Rachel it was a reference to Dark Link. In Link to the Past. <laughs> you have a room where there's a copy of you that yeah. moves the same way you do, and you have to get it to move into a specific spot. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> but it's a little more intelligent it's, than that. Yeah, and it's... um. Anyway, this is dark Lena. And Lena leads through using her own movement. Leads it over. To and the bag gets, with the incendiary gets grenades. one of the flash grenades. And hands it to the creature. The humanoid beat thing. Yep. And it holds it. It holds it. And she pulls the pin. Snaps the thing. And is like, good luck with that. And just yeet. yeet. <laughs> And it explodes. And right before it does that, as they're holding hands and she's getting ready to pull the pin. The proximity again. It starts to look like her. Right. And by the time it explodes, it looks like Natalie Portman. And it lights on fire. It bursts into flames. And then it's just Right. And we don't know why this grenade caused it to burst, combust. Yeah, when the previous one didn't. I mean, because the other one blew up right by the same thing that lights on fire this time. But it didn't light on right, fire like last the time. It, the it, roots on it, the wall. Maybe the roots anyway. hadn't extended that far yet. I don't know. It it ends up setting the entire lighthouse on fire. And we get our final moment of Lena standing outside the lighthouse, looking at the lighthouse as it's on fire. But it's meant to be deliberately ambiguous. Who is standing outside the lighthouse? Right. Because even though... The thing turned into the humanoid, the generic Le- humanoid again. Burning the Lena that was holding the grenade turned into the humanoid-ish thing. Yeah. We don't know if that was real Lena that got turned into. Yeah. What the happened thing, in that moment when it looked Lena like escaped? What happened in that moment when it looked like Lena? What else got transferred? Right. How much did they become one thing in that moment? Right, and so we saw. A lot of Lena go into the creature, but how much of the creature went into Lena? Exactly. Yeah. And we see burning crystal trees and the shimmer disappears. Yep. And this is where we picked up at the beginning of the movie because Lena gets out, they get Lena, and now they're trying to figure out how did she get out? What happened to everybody else? How did she take down the, what What happened? What, what, right. what was it? What happened? Because now the lighthouse is just ash and everything is gone. And she's like, look, I don't know what to tell you. I, I burned it. Uh, you're welcome. Can I go see my husband now? And so they let her go and she walks into the little tent because as soon as the shimmer disappeared, he got better. So he's not dying he anymore. He got better. He got a lot better. <laughs> and so she goes in there and she says, you're not Kane, are you? And he goes, no, I don't think I am. Are you Lena? Are you Lena? And she's just like, Give us a kiss. She deliberately <laughs> she does, does not answer. Not an- she pulls a Nick Knight again. She does not answer that shit. She's like, I don't know, but you could hug me anyway. I just didn't even say anything. They just come in for a hug. Right. And we and see then, his eyes shimmer. I could have almost done without the eye shimmer at the end. His eyes yeah. shimmer, her eyes shimmer. Okay. And we don't know if that's because they were in the shimmer and they're changed. Or are they part of what made the shimmer? Because maybe this was its way of getting out and doing more damage. I, because they'd found it. They'd found a way to destroy it. It needed a way to move around. Or I would have, you know what I would have liked? the the I like the ending. I'm not saying I don't. 
But I think what would have worked a lot better is if we had come in for this hug and then the light behind them just broke into like a prism and then came back, implying that the shimmer was not gone. That I would have thought that would have been okay. Right. It's just localized inside them. It feels so after like so after effect that like the uh, the shimmer on Lena's eyes isn't even completely lined up with her eye. It slightly appears up on her eye lid as well. Like they just dropped a circle on there and didn't quite crop it correctly. Yeah. Um, eh, it's okay. Uh, it's fine. It doesn't ruin the movie for me in any capacity. Uh, I kind I like it, but I think it would have been better if we had continued the light effect we had in the shimmer. If we just had a taste of that at the end, instead of deliberately attributing it. Right. To using the environment rather than the people. Yeah. Yeah. I think I would have liked that better, but overall great movie. <laughs> it's a good movie. Yeah. Um, rewatchable. We haven't watched it since the last time we watched it. It's not not rewatchable, but it's one of those movies you have got to be in the mood for. Right. You don't put this movie on when you're cooking and tune in every once in a while. Right. You don't put this movie on. It's so atmospheric. Yeah. You have to immerse yourself in it it's to an ex- enjoy it. It's an experiential movie. It's one yeah. of those movies you bring over and you, like a lot of the movies we watch where you're like, have you seen this? And someone says no. And you're like, oh my God, we're going to fucking watch this. And you just sit down, check your phones out. Don't look at them at all. Just sit down and really just experience the entirety of this movie, which is what it's how it's meant to be experienced. How any movie is meant to be experienced, really. But because the setting and the lighting and the subtle background effects are so important to your overall understanding of the movie, you really have to be present for this entire movie. And that's what we like. <laughs> it yeah. makes it good. 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 And Natalie Portman's good in this. Oh, yeah. She does an amazing job. Uh, especially like the when they're sitting at the kitchen table yeah her um her emotion her reaction to this slow reveal that kane doesn't remember things and whatever um it's very believable right yeah yes she she plays that really well yeah it's you're you're there with her i'm hit and miss on natalie portman sometimes i really like her and sometimes i'm not sure why they cast her in this it's probably uh, down to the director. Yeah, um, but she she's really she's brilliant in this, and Oscar Isaac's as much as he's in it is good. Everybody's good in this. I don't except for the Ventress character, who is just an enigma to me. Um, but I don't think she's bad. I think it's just the character. I'm right, thinking that particular it's the character. character. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm going to go with. Because it's very, I don't like her and I don't know why I don't like, I know why I don't like her, but I don't know if that was intentional or if that's because, uh, you know what I need to do? I need to find something else that actress is in and watch it because I don't think I've seen anything else that she's been in. Or if I have, I haven't recognized her. And she's also got a strange mouth. I know we talk about this and you're always like, I don't know, but I watch people's mouths when they talk. It's important for me to be able to understand what they're saying. And her mouth is like very flat and it doesn't open very far. It's a very like flappy lip look movement. And it makes it hard for me to like watch her because she doesn't have a lot of lip inflection. It's a very like fish <laughs> where it just opens and shut and it doesn't if like you the, say so. <laughs> the corners of her lips don't move. I don't know. You just, <laughs> just gonna leave you with that. Um, and I think that's probably part of it is her, her mouth is very, the way her mouth moves is very strange. And I think it's cause she's trying to keep, her face as inexpressive as possible. And so to do that, she's almost holding her mouth immobile and only moving it as much as required to gain inflection for the words she's saying. Yeah. Did you have anything else you want to add about this movie? I think that pretty much covers yeah, it. I, think I that mean, covers it. we liked it. It's good. Highly recommended. I think it's, it's definitely horror. Oh, I'm yeah. glad we covered this as a yeah. horror. I was like, ah, should we wait, do this as a sci-fi? No, I'm glad we do it as horror. So I hope you watched it because if not, this is not a movie you want spoiled. Right. Um, you want to watch it fresh the whole right, time. Right, the gradual reveal. And can we all just agree that the bear is just crazy fucking shit? Yeah. <laughs> the bear is just wild. We watched all of Mandy and I wasn't terrified of a single thing in Mandy. But that bear <laughs> just gets me. <laughs> um, I think it's the human voice. Something about the human voice in this terrifying creature. And like the death sound of this human, this like final right. scream for help that is an eternal part of this. Well, and the, the disfigured bear, like yeah. the top half of 
of its skull is exposed. Yeah. Oh, it's wild. It's good. I know I keep saying that. I always say that. I'm sorry. That's me. Who I am. I say it a lot. Also, it's fine. It's good. You know, important parts of my repertoire. Mm-hmm. So if you enjoyed this, feel free to follow us on Instagram. We have a hundred followers Woo-hoo. now. Well, we did at the time of this recording. May have yeah. dropped. I don't know. Maybe we'll lose some thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> but at the time of this recording, we have a hundred followers um, and four Patreons. Woo. One of which we don't know. You could be lucky number five. Did you know that? You could go join Patreon right now. I have a dollar tier. I have a five dollar tier. I have all the way up to a twenty-five dollar tier, which felt ambitious and still feels ambitious, but I'm leaving it because you know what? Somebody out there is gonna fall in love with this, I can tell. One hundred and one. Heck yeah. Which means we could lose one and still be at a hundred. <laughs> um yeah, I'm just I'm happy. I think we're doing I'm happy. Are you happy? Yeah, so we got Patreon, we got Instagram, come follow us. Something happened to the website and it broke. I don't know, it's probably related to the fact that I'm a brilliant website engineer. <laughs> um, it works, it's just that we can't tell what the links say anymore. So I'm going to sort that out. Yeah, the button color and the text color in the button is the same. Yeah, I didn't do that. Something did that. I'm going to blame the cosmic storm, like the sunstorm that's happening right now, solar storm. It's also why I've been moody all week, so I'm just going to say everything for this entire week that's it's the solar storm solar storm yeah yep. uh yeah i'm just gonna leave it at that before the solar storm wipes out this recording so remember sometimes the strangest things are the most beautiful too so be who you are and love what you love until next time friends bye, bye.